welcome to Beesock Global with the Women in Food and Farming April broadcast. Christine, say hello to everyone. Hello, everybody. Nice to see you back. Hope you had a good Easter. Yeah, so we're just uh, talking in our in our green room that it's snowing currently with Christine, but we've got sun here in Berry St Edmunds, but we seem to have a, a right old mixture at the moment of, um, of, of weathers, but hopefully everything is going to be pointed towards sun, sun, sun. So today we are speaking on culture and values, and uh, a little bit later we're going to bring in uh, our fantastic guest speaker as per the invite of... Um, of Christine uh, Beverly Dixon uh, but just for um, everyone on uh, the, the catch up YouTube and, and podcast let's just give a little bit of a background to Christine's group Women in Food and Farming so this is a group of professional women in food agriculture and the land-based industries at all stages of their careers they get together to discuss business issues support each other via mentorship and advice and help generate networks of contacts that might be useful to themselves and their businesses Founded in 2011 by Christine, take on CBE, the group started back in 2011, I just said that, were just five women and has now grown to over 500 members. So that's one thing if, uh, we just wanted to, Christine and I wanted to highlight, if you're watching um, and you're not a member of Wood, Women in Food and Farming, uh, please do become a member. It's very easy. If you go and find Claire Smith, you, you might be very lucky and be with her in the breakout rooms a little bit later. Or if you look up Claire Smith on LinkedIn, or if you go to more people, um, and Women in Food and Farming on Google, that takes you straight to Claire's landing page on the More People website, and you can sign up to join to join the group. So Christine is known to many as the first grocery code educator and head of the co-op's farming business. She's also just been appointed chair of Assured, Assured Food Standards, which operates the Red Tractor Assurance Scheme, amongst other roles. In, in our strange times, uh, Beanstalk is very proud to offer our extensive platforms to allow the w Women in Food and Farming group to continue their conversation and debate and encourage new members ongoing to join them be that on our uh, virtual broadcast series. So in our April broadcast, we have the great pleasure of, of having Beverly on, um, and we're gonna be discussing culture and values within business and our own lives. Just before we go live with that, Christine, um, how, how are you? What, what are you seeing? You, you, from what I can appear, um, from what I can see over the last month, you've been very, very busy. I suppose you're getting right into the, uh, the, the um, um, what would I say, the, the, uh, the, the blood and bullets of, uh, of your red tractor role, are you? I think I'm inside the engine of the Red Tractor Max. Uh, yes, uh, it's, uh, uh, they launched a consultation on the new standards on the day I joined and nobody told me it was going to happen. And it's been a little bit of a bloodbath with uh, the team be pretty much being the punch ball. And uh, so I've had to get engrossed in the, in the whole workings of it in a much more fun and share normally would um, to sort of help find the way forward. But uh, I've always liked a challenge. I just didn't realize I was taking one on. No, no, I, you stole my, my words. If anyone was up for that job, as, as we said right at the beginning when it was uh, uh, nominated that you, you got the role, Christine, uh, as we said at the time, you, you, you're, there aren't many people that could do such, such a position. Uh, and you look at uh, some other organisations that are, are going through a bit of heartache at the moment. I think Red Tractor is in a, a very good uh, position with, uh, with, with yourself. So, so let's get on to, to today, um, Christine. Why did you want to look at culture and values? Because, I suppose in your background, this is something that's been fundamentally key to, to you and the businesses that you've been associated with. Yeah. I, I wanted to correct one thing that you said. You said it was my group. I don't think it's my group. It's everybody's group. And when we have our little breakout groups at the end, we've got lots of people who are part of the steering group who um, will listen. And if you say you're interested in something, we'll pick it up as an idea. So the whole idea of having a talk on culture was something that was discussed in one of those groups. And I thought, I know just the person I want to talk about that because I've been, you know, I would say over the last 15 years, I've been hugely impressed by the culture at G's and trying to understand it. I have recruited people from there. I've tried to recruit people from there. And I've loved, I mean, the, one of the people I did recruit actually went and asked John Shropshire's advice as to whether he should join the business or not. I mean, the loyalty to that business is something I have not witnessed anywhere else. Yes, and you think of our tenure, uh, Christine, over the last 20, 20, 25 years of um, agricultural businesses and uh, fresh produce businesses, and, and you all see this cycle of businesses grow, fall away. If there's been one stable factor within agribusiness and fresh produce, it's definitely been G's. And why is that? Because, because of the people. Should, should we bring Beverly in, Christine? Yeah. Beverly, can you come in, please? So, Christine, can you remember how you first met Beverly? Um, no, that's not fair. He asked me <laughs> to 
earlier and I said I couldn't remember and Bev said she could. So therefore, um, he knew I didn't know the answer to that. Bev, how did we meet? Be Beverly, just turn on your ears, please. Beverly, just... Just on mute at the moment. That phrase that uh, we were all going to Thank avoid. you. Uh, oh, she said, yeah. okay. Turn on my ears. That was getting a bit confusing already. <laughs> I've got the headset on. Um, well, it's great to see everyone here. And um, yeah, so how did we meet, Christine? Well, I think it was one of these early events of, of uh, women in agriculture when we were in the Farmers Club. And at that point, we, um, I remember it being a, it was a great evening. And I think actually Emily Norton talked about her leadership leadership course that in fact have we just been discussing that she yes, did the, the delivery, yeah. delivery one yeah that's right she did yeah. and um anyway great evening and at that point i was part of the the board of mds and we were looking to recruit a new non-executive cha uh, chairman for mds and i tried to persuade you at that point that it would be a good idea and uh, i remember you were so busy so diligent in doing what you were doing you were saying no I haven't, really haven't got time for this anyway I didn't let her get away with that and eventually Christine did apply and um, obviously among the amazing skills that she's got and experience there was one notable thing about the interview that I will always remember the shoes she was wearing <laughs> Oh no! God. <laughs> and in Sorry. fact, if you ever get the opportunity to be with Christine face to face, do have a look at her shoes. They're bound to be wacky. So, um, Christine, yeah, you've been well since then. We actually then went travelling to Spain, um, and that was through the connection with MDS. And um, we talked to the um, industry association there, and they still talk about Christine's presentation. And we also visited the G's business. So I suppose got to know each other better then. Fantastic. Christina, we've got to ask now, what, what shoes have you got on? Um, I, they, they aren't that interesting, but I can show you. <laughs> but I did, at least oh. they're not my slippers. <laughs> That's fantastic. What, what, what a way to introduce each other. So, so come on, let, let's get, get into this. Christine, could mm. I just ask you to turn off your, your video and also your audio? Because your audio is, um, um, I think, a, a bit scratchy because of the snow, snow outside. So, so Beverly, if it's OK, just for um, everyone, especially on the podcast, mm. they, they really are keen to hear um, people's background. It's just let me mm. give you give uh, the, the background on, on yourself. So as, we, as, we've, as we've already intimated, Beverly's incredibly well known and regarded. She's Group HR Director at G's, which is part of the Shropshire Group. They grow, pack, distribute and sell salad and vegetables to UK, European and American supermarkets and wholesalers. Inspired by the commercial and international focus of her role, she leads teams delivering HR in the UK, Europe, Africa and the USA. From her knowledge base gained in FMCG, telecoms and consult consultancy, she's highly involved in M&A, business improvement programs and influencing policy makers. She's very well regarded for having a creative approach to, to HR, underpinned by commercial outlook and appreciation of working with a multicultural team in the UK and overseas and developing sustainable business through, through people. Um, but if it's okay to mention, um, I, I, I was just thinking back about your telecoms um, background, mm. and I remember years ago going to Cranford's uh, University Bash, and um, we had um, a senior level individual from uh, BT, I can't, I can't remember his name, I'm sure you'd know of him, mm. and, and he said that uh, culture and values, it's so difficult to create a business with positive culture and values if you've got a business of over 500 people. It's even mm. more difficult to create um, culture and value within a business if you're on a multi-site basis and with different units with, uh, with over 500 people. So mm. you've got double trouble, he said. Mm. Then someone said, well, what if you've got some uh, businesses that are overseas? Um, and he said, well, you've got triple trouble. And if you look at G's, that's exactly what, what you've got. So I think all credit mm. to yourself and your, your colleagues that you are remarkable as a, as a, as a group because you are so spread. Mm. How, oh, how, what, what, what's the, what's the answer on an, on an HR perspective? I wouldn't even know how, how to, mm. how to begin. How, how do you keep it all together, Beverly? Well, hopefully in this conversation, we'll kind of explore that. And I'm happy to sort of unpick it and have the conversation with you, Max, and share the odd slide that I've got um, that will help explain kind of the concepts behind some of the things that I'm going to talk about as we, as we go through. But culture and values, they are so important, aren't they? And so difficult to get right. But I think, to be honest, when you're working somewhere and 
your own values align with the culture and values of that business, you intuitively know when it's right, but equally, you know when it's wrong. And it's quite hard to put your finger on, but you, you're either aligned with that business or not. Now, I don't, I don't think it's um, necessarily always as black and white as that, because I think our personal values have to be in congruence with the organization's culture so that you know it's quite easy to um to connect with that business but if by chance they're not maybe you probably wouldn't even apply for that um sector that business that organization in the first place um so it's a tough one but i think you know some some of the um some of the quiz questions that we've got lined up will just help illustrate some of that Beverly, we didn't tell everyone. There's a quiz. Oh, it's there's like, a quiz. It's, it's like a cheesy night down down the uh, down, down the Royal Oak. We're, we're going to have a, have a have a quiz. The um, one thing that we're we're picking up, and we did discuss it with other broadcasts. Mm. That I think you might be involved um, mm. in, with us. That said, the younger generation are very keen to be aligned to businesses that are that are doing good. And, it, and mm. it's interesting with uh, with G's with, with my recruitment hat on. Mm. Um, I've always had a bit of a, a throwaway question as to name me the three top companies that you'd like to be aligned to on an ag and a fresh produce perspective. And over the last ten years, G's has always been in in that top top three. Mm. Whilst mm. whilst there's others that don't, well, just like in any sector of businesses, uh, people don't really want to be aligned to it. And I think again, we've had this conversation that you find it sometimes a bit difficult to um, attract people because of your location, because mm. your location is, well, it's not London, is it? Um, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a glorious um, area, but um, it, it is re relatively re remote, relatively rural, but it's not yeah. buzzing. And for you to be able to be in my de facto top three of um, fresh produce companies to be to be aligned to, again, it comes to this culture culture and, uh, and values element. So, mm. so what what do you want to go into the quiz now, or do you want me to keep keep going? How, how would you like to play this, Beverly? Let's have a little look at this quiz. Um, let's see if we can share the screen and make it work. And uh... and our quiz master tonight is yeah. And the prize is going to be a tin of dog biscuits. Yeah, it might be. <laughs> uh, there we go. Go for you and slideshow. Right, Max, your first question. Okay, everyone. Question A, what percentage of adults would not apply to an organisation unless its values aligned with their own personal values? Question A. Has everybody thought of an answer? Put it in the chat. If we do have chat, we Good probably idea. don't, do we? We do. We have chat. Put it in the chat, everyone. Put it in the or, chat. Or scribble it down on that blank, blank envelope yeah. next to you. Shall I go for the answer, yeah? Yep. 73 percent what percentage of adults would not apply to an organization yeah and and and, and again especially with this younger generation mm. we're seeing this drive of of people wanting to do good and they can do good by being aligned to businesses that are, mm. that are, that are doing good so i think there's a definite drive beverly in the, in the respect of societal uh, behavioral change on, on this aspect so it's fascinating that mm. let's so go, go for then. the next one so B, what percentage of adults would look for a job elsewhere if their current organization's culture deteriorates? Let's go for that again. B, what percentage of adults would look for a job elsewhere if their current organization culture deteriorates? Oh, that's a fascinating question, Beverly. Yeah. I'm, just thinking, I'm thinking of um, some of the businesses that are out there, the likes of ooh, D Deliveroo, Uber, Amazon, some of the stories that have been coming out over, over the weekend about some of those organisations. And if you were in there from the start, how would you feel um, about it in the future? Mm. Mm. So, Things so are different. Go Let's go. 71%. Wow. So that's, again, that's, that's, that's fascinating that if, even adults – um, if, if they've got that opportunity, would look to go elsewhere if the culture deteriorates. Okay, let's go for... Um, Wait for this one. Go. C, what percentage of leaders think that they understand their organisation's culture? So that again, C, what percentage of leaders think that they understand their organisation's culture? So what do you think, everyone? Wow, look at, look at all those numbers, 90, 40, 65, 60, 50. Come on, Beverly. Well, wait for this. <laughs> What percentage of leaders think they understand the organization's <laughs> culture? 28%. Wow. Well, there's, um, there's something that we always say in, in, with my recruitment head on, um, back on, that if you want to find out, Beverly, what's going on in, in, a, in a business, don't ask the boss. Ask the mm. forklift driver because mm. they know absolutely everything. It's a bit of a glib response, but the, 
the, the the people within the business know so much more. And you must see the same thing that when I meet some, some senior le leaders, when you actually get a report with them, you find out they're actually quite commercially lonely. They, they don't know what's going on in their own businesses, let alone um, out, outside, because people perhaps are just telling them what, what they want to hear. Mm. Um, and if and if you've got a poor leader who doesn't doesn't recognise that, they're going to steer steer the boat in that in, in that particular direction. I think it's interesting that you say that because if you um if if, if you kind of read any uh, strategy books, um, you'll know that. Peter Drucker, he always quotes, he's got a brilliant snappy sentence where he says, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And if you think about how much time our leaders spend working out what the strategy is, having strategy away days, then working out how to implement it, who to get involved, how it's all going to happen. But yet what he's saying is the people are the most important aspect of implementing any strategy. And if the people are not aligned with that with with the, with the company values and the culture then one the strategy won't get implemented or derailed or two it will um it won't be real it's all about efficacy isn't it so i think you know those quiz questions illustrate that if people don't think things are genuine and real they'll vote with their feet they will leave either they won't apply and they'll go elsewhere or they will vote with their feet once they're with you so I think it's really important that culture is kind of at the forefront of everyone's mind and certainly the leaders of the business and helping them to understand how much they can affect culture um, is kind of top of our list when it comes to any of our leadership development. And I, I also reference um, Edgar Schein, I don't know if this is kind of useful, but he talks about the most important thing um, a leader can do is to develop the culture of an organization. And if you don't do that, he says, the culture will manage you. And furthermore, you might not even notice that it is managing you. So you, in other words, if you're not focused and paying attention to these things and taking those temperature checks around the business and really talking and listening to the people that you're working with to understand what it is that they want and how they feel and where they think there's any incongruence, then it could all be happening around you without you even noticing. And that's when people will potentially leave or or not apply and certainly or derail some of the direction in which in which you want to go so it's so important and yet it's so difficult to kind of exactly nail down and put your finger on um, but it is something that we certainly kind of build awareness through our development programs with our leaders so with, with the G group, if it's okay, and, and, and tell me if it's not, not appropriate, but just using that as an example, mm. did, did the, the culture and the, and the values of the G's group, did that start with John Shropshire's father? Mm. And, and and so it's just been, mm. the foundation's been there right right from the, from the, from the get-go. Mm. Or was it John Shropshire? Or was it John Shropshire and you? How, how did it uh, positively manifest itself within within your group? Okay, so let's, let's kind of um, tell the story of the link between values and culture so um i i like the metaphor really of um kind of a boy in the sea that's a nautical boy so <laughs> if you think about if a, several boys are, are anchored in the sea then the anchor is is are the culture is sorry is the values and that those values don't change they're anchored into the in, into the sand at the bottom of the sea. And whatever ha is happening on top of the water, however choppy it gets, the buoys may go slightly away. There might be slightly some, some tension on the ropes, but they don't go too far away from those core values. And then when it's a still mill pond, the buoys will be directly aligned above the values. And that's when there's least tension on, on the cord. So... In a family business like G's, then it is um, the values are formed by the family values. Now, of course, it can all adjust and the culture can float around a little bit on top of the water. But those core values are the Shropshire's family values. And certainly, you, you know, you, you mentioned John Shropshire. He, he 
will talk about the G's company values as um, well, their trust, efficiency, quality, can do and expertise. But if you think about the trust one, that's the one that we kind of pay real attention to and really focus on. And one of the kind of um, descriptors of, of our trust is to treat others as you'd like to be treated yourself. And that is one of Guy Shropshire, so the founder of the business's um, sayings. So yes, well and truly anchored by the Shropshire family. Um, and if you think about then the boys on top of the water yeah. may float around a little bit and adjust depending on kind of all sorts of things which we could talk about, which are, you know, maybe different um different inter you know parts of the business in um, different countries in which we work in. And, and um, I think your, your analogy of, of those boys is, it, is fan, fantastic. I've got this expression in my head about train, mm. trainer, trainer. And if, are, are, do you spend a lot of time with your senior leaders in the, in the UK and overseas just making sure, reinforcing the, the, those values so they get it, so that, they, that, that, that they're, they're on the seabed holding that chain with all of their team? Or, or, or do they just get, get it naturally? How does that work, please? No, it does, it does get reinforced. So... In, in thinking about an, another thing I'll chuck in, in case anybody wants to look these things up afterwards, but Johnson and Scholes have a really nice um, kind of analysis called a cultural web. And you can go, walk around this culture web. And what and some of the things that are in, in place on that web would be kind of the rituals and the symbols and the processes and policies that and um, and and you know talking about power structures, which is all the um, all the different influences that you were talking about, Max. But if you think about um, some of the policies and practices, they serve to reinforce the values. So everybody's EPR, so employee performance review appraisals, um, all come back to the values. As so, it's as much about how you do business as well as what you're doing so yeah you you know we need you to deliver objectives that you can targets that people have been set however it's got to be in a way in which is fitting with the values so um half of everyone's um annual appraisal if not more frequently than that is divided into how and what and um, that's just one example um but it's not to say that um, we can't get better. I mean, we're really proud of our culture and our values, and we work hard to keep them embedded. Um, but we know that the more we challenge ourselves, the better it can be. And quite recently, I ran a, a session with some of our early careers group, and they were talking about, you know, what sort of culture would you like G's to be? And it's not way off mark as to where it is now. But as you can imagine, with the Generation Z, as you mentioned earlier, the younger people, they want more flexibility, more working from home, everything's digital, um, you know, less process and control, all those things. So then we then can have a conversation using the culture web about, well, okay, where are we now? If that's where we want to get to for the Generation Zs, what sort of things will we have to nudge and change? But it's all anchored back into the values. So I don't, you know, I don't want it to sound as though you can completely change a culture and be totally opposite to where, where you started. But I think, you know, keep those anchored, keep those values anchored. And then the boys on the top with, with the illustrate the culture can actually move slightly depending on who it is that you're working with. I, I think that's, again, really interesting that, that you have asked uh, a, a, mm. a percentage of your of your team, what culture do mm. they want within your business? I bet if we ask everyone else on this call, how, how often have we been asked that in the last two, three years with the businesses that we're involved with, whatever whatever age group, what culture mm. would you like with uh, within this business? Because I, I do sometimes fear that um, agribusiness have, and fresh produce, um, especially the likes of fresh produce, because it's we're living day, day by mm. day, especially with the with the with the past year. Those sort of questions never never get asked. But going back mm. to the point that you were making at the at the beginning, that you've got to be very careful that you're leading the culture of the business, and the business isn't leading you uh, potentially down down the the, the, mm. the wrong route. I, I suppose, Beverly, that comes on to the, the next inevitable question. If you had a 
one of the people on the call today or, or there was a business that you do within the sector that was struggling with with culture mm-hmm. and, and values what would your recommendation be to, to go in and 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 to secure those boys for them when currently they're adrift mm-hmm. they're, they're a raging storm mm-hmm. how, how would you assist them I think I, I think I'd start with kind of clarifying and confirming what the values are and making sure that what's written, say, on a piece of paper or on all the notice boards and things like that are truly what people are living and reinforcing. So, you know, we've already talked about the leaders having a massive influence on the authenticity of culture and values of a business because whatever they are talking about, whatever they report on, whatever they're interested in, illustrates the importance of those things to all colleagues now if that's completely different to what's written on the piece of paper or the notices on the wall then that's where you get the incongruence so I think I'd probably start there and just really kind of um, reaffirm what the company's values are and maybe describe them in a in a way in which people can understand and then I would go out and talk to people and talk to people about, you know, what what does what do these values mean to them? And don't forget, culture is a kind of how things are done around here. So if you've got, you know, two or three or four or five values, what does that mean in terms of the way things are done around here? You know, what would where would we be working? What sort of things we'll be doing? How would your performance be measured? Um, what you know, access to equipment would you have? All those sorts of simple things. Um, what would people be wearing? You know, sometimes in an organisation, it's about uniform. Yeah. Wow. wow. Well, and and it, is this a job for HR, um, or, or 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 is this a job for uh, the, the the senior leadership team, or is it a combination, or, is it, or, or does it all just depend on uh, the, the, the the particular business in the in question? I think it depends on the business, doesn't it? It's undoubtedly a job for the leaders of the business, without doubt. And more often than not, people, or HR professionals will have kind of worked in and around this field and therefore will be able to assist and guide and direct and put things in place. Um, but it's well and truly in the lap of the leaders of the business, I would say, because of the influence that they have. And, and so, Beverly, I don't want to lead the witness again, but do you think uh, agribusiness, fresh produce, uh, is, is relatively unsophisticated in comparison to some of the other sectors that you've been involved in, like like, like telecoms? Um, can, can we do a lot more? I don't think it's unsophisticated, I, um, but um, it's different. So... Uh, it, when I, in my experience, so I've worked mainly in retail, I've met in fresh produce, I've been a consultant and so kind of experienced lots of different businesses. But depending on the business model, so, you know, certainly a not for profit business will have a different culture to a FTSE 100 because they're driven by different things. And you'll find that the people that work in those businesses are motivated by different things. And that's because they're aligning their own value system with with the business model before they even start. So it's not that um, any different sector or organization is less sophisticated than another. It's just different depending on that business model, who works there, where they're working, which part of the country they're operating in, which country in total they're operating in, um, and what the people's um, values and experiences, personal attitudes and beliefs are that are among the colleagues. So um, I don't think it's that. I think I think it'd be great if all businesses, including fresh produce businesses, could spend more time talking to their colleagues yep. about what's important. Yep, yep. And I, I go back to my that that Cranfield example that I gave earlier, <laughs> and you, you'll be able. To, you, you've probably got got the slide like I have somewhere that it's been shown mm-hmm. time and time again that those companies that invest in training and development um, into their teams see a far far faster growth rate probability and turnover yeah. wise um, and I suppose that's a bit of frustration I've I've got about the fresh produce sector I, I won't call it uh, unsophisticated again mm. but it's just the nature of the beast especially with the year that we've just had yeah. we've seen so many things ha- have to be just pushed aside uh, because there's uh, be, being an emergency mm. but then again being optimistic there's such an opportunity opportunity now to really grab that culture and, and those those values mm. and to, to push on through to make a real difference yeah. for, for, for the business 
for for the for the environment for for, for people and to do good with the sector i think it's just an amazing opportunity certainly in fresh produce that we've got to promote what's great about it yeah. and it is about the sustainability the environment the fact that we're producing fresh healthy wholesome food we couldn't be in a better sector so to be proud of that and to promote it and get the message over and be good at communicating and I think that's probably listening and communicating is probably where we can get better. I don't think, you know, generally it's well understood what amazing businesses we're, you know, we're all involved in. Yeah. And uh, okay. that's down to us to talk about it, really. Uh, Beverly, two, two points on, on that, uh, on the point of uh, talking about it and promoting it. If you're not aware, this, this year, 2021, is the FAO United Nations uh, Year of Fruit and Veg. And we were very privileged to do an interview last week with the, the director, Marcella, director of um, uh, collaborations for the FAO in the United Nations. And they've got so much passion about it. But uh, just looking at their, their stats and some of the, the postings, it seems to be all the nutritionists are behind it. But there's a lot of people within the actual trade that aren't aware that it's the UN FAO uh, 2021 Year of uh, uh, Fruit and Veg. If you just dial that up, hashtag 2021 Year of Fruit and Veg, there's loads of uh, free logos that you can have that you can put on your website uh, with the UN all over it to promote your, your business so that you can get the, the halo effect off the, off the back of that. And, and second point, Beverly, you very kindly put, uh, gave us a quiz um earlier i was just looking at some of the stats guess how many food businesses have been created um uh, during this uh, this this last year of our of our pandemic have, have a guess um, two thousand uh, six hundred and fifty eight and and the, the the reason for, for mentioning that if, if those businesses um, are coming to you because they, they don't want to be a flash in the pan they want to be here for the for the long term mm. and and you can just imagine what the the the, ba the bulk of those are going to be like in the respect of the foundation that they want to set up they want to be uh, very very high on sustainability very high on um on the environmental side mm. with a new business what would you be your advice as to how they can set up culture and values when it's just a team of one perhaps two but they want to be 10 20 50 people how would you set up the culture and values with with a new food setup, new food startup, please. Start to capture it. So, what? Because probably in those early days, the culture and values—they're probably wearing on their shirt sleeves. It's probably really obvious. So capture it, video shots, you know, little captions, some press releases. What are people saying about you? What stories are people telling about that food business? What stories are you telling about yourself? All of that will stand in good stead for when they do increase to 5, 10, 20, 30 people because you'll be able to tell the stories and that illustrates the culture. Uh, well, well done. And there's the, the fantastic mm. example, uh, Beverly, of Innocent Drinks. Uh, mm. Back in the day when Innocent uh, uh, started up, uh, they were getting upwards of 3,000 applications uh, a month of mm. people wanting to join them because of the culture and values that, that, uh, that the three mm. founders had, uh, had created. So if you could create that magic dust with yes. the new food set, set up, uh, not only, only are you going to get the people mm. coming to join you, you're going to get the customers. And uh, if you're looking for it, perhaps the investment as well, do you think? Yes. Yeah, I think. Um, and, and certainly we know through ESG now that investors are more and more monitoring what companies are doing in terms of the, the you know, the whole ESG people profit planet. And so it's it's becoming as equally important for the financial institutions, which goes a long way to say it, it says a lot, doesn't it? It does totally. Mm. So just just to summarise, before we bring some of the the, the group back in, and before mm. we go to the the, the breakout room, uh, with everything that you've learnt on culture and values within G's group and on your previous background, what would you have done differently within G's to make it even more successful? The, the whole culture and, and, and values piece, please. please? Mm. Oh, that's that's a really challenging question, Max. Um, I think. Um, yeah, I think I would have spent even more time on it. Even more, I don't think, I think it's a kind of never-ending requirement to keep talking to people in different sections, in different groupings of people and really get to understand what they think and where we can tweak it. Because I think we're just talking about little tweaks can make a massive difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Is there is there a problem though about ROI, return of investment? I can imagine if you've got some grumpy yeah. uh, F- FD and all they're looking at is the bottom right hand corner of the Excel spreadsheet, and, and you're you're requesting to spend more time yeah. with the, with the, with the team um, to to really yes. major on. Co- and values and they say beverly what's the return of investment here yeah. we need these people working we don't need talk shops we don't need talking shops yeah because had, 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 that's going to happen in lots of businesses how do you counter that oh because you've got to keep promoting it so you put it in kind of the rules and regs as well don't you so in, like i say in the appraisals you've got to talk about the values in there and if those leaders are not living up to those values then you know that that has an effect so they know they've got to do it and it's all about education generally we all need kind of refocusing, don't we? And um, just yeah. kind of pointing in a slightly different direction sometimes. So it is about investing in people as leaders to understand what your role as a leader is. Yeah. And I don't think we can do enough of that either. You know, we don't want to just send somebody on one development program and assume that's it, job done. Yeah. The, the best thing about running a business is employing mm. people. The worst thing about running a business is employing people. You. So when, when you're interviewing people or, or your team are, um, can you identify pretty quickly uh, those that have got those cultures and values that will, will mirror those of the of the G's group? Yeah, you, you become more astute to that. And, and I'm sure you do too, Max, because you interview people for all kinds of different businesses. So in the questions that you're asking them, how they like to work, what's important to them, you know, what motivates them, you're automatically um, matching that to the, the job role or the part of the business or, in fact, the whole business that they're applying for. Um, and, you know, I think it's um, I think it's incumbent upon us, even in a job advert or describing the role, to be able to describe what it's really like to work here. And that, in describing that, that's the culture. And that might be the culture of the department or the sector in which you're working as well as the overall organisation. Beverly, well, well said. Let's get the, the, the rest of the team back in. Christine, uh, Deborah, Eve, Camilla, uh, Kirsty. So we could just have a quick uh, catch up before we go go to the, the, the breakout rooms. Christine, what what, what do you think? I, I think um, uh, Beverly is, is right right on the money. And if people, if, if they don't already know the G's group, have a look at their, their, their website and have a look at the, the social media. And I, uh, Beverly, we didn't talk about it. I did a great interview with um, uh, yeah. D- Dan Cross of Love Beats in the, in the, in the States. And he, he, he's a completely different character to you, but you could a- absolutely feel the culture of values 4,000 miles away. It was exactly the same with this bearded chat chap in, uh, in, in uh, where is he? The, the Never Eat. Uh, the, Rochester. The East, the east Coast mm. of, uh, of the States. Uh, fl- fl- flogging sugar beet. Christine, what did you think? I was just going to say, you said look at their website, look at their social media. But if you're trying to attract people into the organisation, there's no point just saying all the right things on the website. If what they when they scratch the surface, you don't live up to that culture, they will realise and they will go. So it's not about saying the right things. And I think particularly with uh, the generation of people coming out of university, they all they all care about the ethical, the environmental, the social sides of, of work. And uh, you can say the right things, but you've got to live them as well. Totally. And you can see that from various social media postings. So there's a classic example that we used recently. There was a footballer who uh, 10 minutes before the end of a game that he was losing, uh, he uh, posted out on social media that he was uh, really happy that they, that he and his team had won the match. So the, he, he's deployed his social media posting to some, uh, uh, some some external company to do it. You can tell very quickly if, if uh, a business or an individual is, or is, is authentic or or not. Camilla, what, what's your experience of culture and values within business? Uh, so at the moment, I work in a startup. So we're a small team, ah, 10 people. Yeah. So uh, I think that actually puts you in a great perspective because you're able to build a culture as you go along. And um, I think for us, it's we don't talk so much about values, as Beverly said, but something that we do try and keep at the core of everything that we build, we make software for farmers, is trying to think, well, what is the benefit that we're trying to deliver to the farmer and how are we trying to help them? And so when we build something, we can then tie it back to, is it helping that? And I guess that's quite separate to our working culture of how we work together and how we try and collaborate. And and Camilla, are you confident that you've got your boys uh, well well planted into the seabed? Ready for yeah, I, I, I would say I am. Um, in terms of that 
where are we trying to go as we grow and develop the product fitting back to what is our core thing that we're trying to achieve yeah yeah i'd, I'd love what beverly was said about that startup question that just put it all down do do videos encapsulate it so that you can keep keep on bringing that out eve what, what about you culture and values I suppose you've you got a, a slightly a decent uh, mentor in, in the family to, to have assisted you, but what have you seen externally? So I um, I work for a, a global agri-tech business, and I, I have been for just, just under a year. Um, but one of the first onboarding documents that I got given was um, the was basically on values and the goals for the business. And I was shown uh, the kind of, uh, the intranet, which had all documents as to kind of people showing that they're striving for those. Um, and I think coming on as a new employee, that was great to kind of know those from the off so you knew exactly what you were aiming for and what you're working towards. So that's good. But um, I suppose I had a question actually for Beverly throughout the, the presentation, and that was whether with the anchor analogy, does that imply that values, the values of the business are fixed? Um, and that the culture is changeable or do they do both value and culture change as the time goes on? No, I think the values are fixed and the values are fixed through well, certainly in a, in a private organization because they are the structure mm. of family values well and truly fixed. The culture can change. It won't go too far away from the values. Otherwise, the cord will snap. And if it does, that's it. The culture's gone and broken and completely changed. And maybe that's some of the examples that Max was talking about today where, you know, the business model has changed halfway through somebody's employment there. That's when the, that's when the cord snaps. So the values are probably still there. They're probably still, you know, wanting to build a great business, treat people well, all those sorts of things. But the way in which they're doing business has just snapped the cord. Deborah, what, so, so, Eve, is that okay? Because we're slightly running out of, uh, out of time. Yeah, yeah. De Deborah, culture and values. You, yeah, very you, important. I think very important and growing in importance. Um, I'm very minded that G's engages with the growers that they work with in the same way, ah. not just the employees. So, and growers can be quite uh, um, acidic if they don't like things, but they are incredibly positive about the benefits of working with G's. So that's, that's, that's impressive. Um, I'm, I'm lucky enough to have worked for some, some big organisations. And to be fair, they have spent a lot of time on uh, engaging and being encompassing with, with values, which, which is good to see. And, and reflecting I, I that say, is positive. And just to say, when we do the record of this, uh, Deborah's uh, son has uh, very kindly made us a video about culture and values because Deborah, he's, uh, he's involved in the sector, isn't, isn't he? And so we're yeah. we're we, have, we haven't got time to roll it, but we're going to put it on the record. So if you if you want to see that, you'll be able to catch up for, on that uh, a, a little bit later. And, and, and Kirsty, with your role within MDS, you, you th you've got this really eclectic uh, situation that you're looking after, um, help me, how, how many trainees currently? How many? Eight, nearly 80 um, trainees because we're just going through our changeover so the old ones are leaving us and the new ones are, are starting with us um, okay. and we're, we're in quite like you said we are in quite a unique situation due to the, the the type of people that we are recruiting we only have them for a short period of time they are fresh most of them fresh out of university and for them culture and values is really important but um, they don't actually work with us so we have to have really strong values and really share that out and we, we do lots around um social media in particular not just us telling the world what our values are but we get the trainees to take control of our social media so that they can demonstrate that we're actually following through with our values Excellent. And, and are you finding that the trainees that are coming to you, and I know you'll be relatively rigorous in your selection, but are they already uh, there for it? Have they got an appetite to be incredibly positive and, yeah. and upbeat about culture and values? Absolutely. absolutely. It's, it's something that we, we, we really have over the last 34, five years that the, the programme has been running. The values have never changed. We've changed how we do things, but the values have never changed. It's very much what uh, Beverly was saying. Um, and the ones who get onto the program and continue to succeed in it, they have to follow through with our values. It's a two-way street. Um, wow. We give a promise, but they they also have to reciprocate. Fantastic. Hey, everyone, we're slightly running out of time just before we go to the, the breakout rooms. Christine, is there anything you'd like to say before 
we, uh, we, we move on. Uh, no, I just wanted to thank everybody very much for coming. Um, we built this network on the basis that everybody brought a guest along. So maybe you could think about uh, telling one more person about it if you think that they're useful. There are lots of podcasts that are available on the Beanstalk, Beanstalk Global site. Um, and uh, please, in your session, talk about what you might like to have as future topics uh, so I can plan them ahead. Fantastic. And if you want to join, if you go to more people, if you go find Claire Smith at more people or just dial in women and food and farming, more people, you go straight to the landing page there. Beverly, you've asked me to, to summarise, but I'm, I'm not going to. You're going to summarise. How would you summarise culture and values in a paragraph, please, Beverly? That means I have to unmute first. Um, culture and values high, of highest importance highest importance in um should be a highest importance in the leader's mind culture eats strategy for breakfast don't forget that one um and talk to people about the values so communicate it in whichever way that's doable and possible but more importantly listen to what people are saying to make sure that what is being lived out and the way we're doing business is aligned with the values and give people the opportunity to kind of have their say about how they'd like it nudged in the future and then promote all the benefits about our fabulous um, sector and and how it how it will appeal to all to people with all sorts of different values now because it is all about fresh food production and the environment and doing things farming in a different way Beverly, well, well said yes if the, if the timing was the, the, the timing is so correct mm. so appropriate now for, mm. for this sector to just push on um, and especially with, mm. the, with that positivity and culture and values Beverly thank you very much for the master class we'll, we'll stop it there we're going to move out to the, the breakout room so the fantastic Kirsty is going to allocate us all those listening on the podcast and YouTube thank you very much make sure you subscribe and we'll see you in uh, in May uh, Christy won't you for, for our next Women in Food and Farming everyone thank you very much mm.